Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Texas Pinball Festival 2015. I hope you guys are all having a good time playing some games out there and, and enjoying all the festivities that are going on this weekend. I'm proud to, pr to present to you a famed pinball designer. He's done such games as Judge Dredd, Black Rose, and Creature from the Black Lagoon, I think uh, most people are familiar with. And of course, more recently, Stern, Mustang, and also WrestleMania. Correct. So guys, please welcome John Trudeau. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here again. Not here again, but just around. <laughs> I'm just going to run you a, a, a quick little uh, tour of the, the games that I've been involved with. I've started a long time ago. It was 1979 when I got involved in this incredible industry uh, for a small little company in uh, Addison, Illinois, making cocktail pinball machines called Game Plan. And G Game Plan... <clears throat> Uh, come on, come on, come on. Well, prior to that, my in interests were in bingos. Well, who's that guy? I don't know. Back when I was 21, believe it or not. We played a lot of uh, electromechanicals and game plans started with the cocktail pinballs. This is where I cut my teeth on them. I worked in the factory for about a year, uh, troubleshooting these. And had a good time with it and I learned how to uh, spend most of the day bent over from the waist down that's how you had to work on these things anybody who has ever worked on a cocktail pinball knows and you have to be very careful when you get up because everything is hanging out waiting to gouge you in the back of the head we built sharpshooter there Roger on the back glass that was their, that was my first introduction to uh, upright pinball. Anybody that has any questions on the way, please feel free to interrupt and wave wave me down because maybe I won't turn around in time. Uh, I, I got involved with doing artwork for a game called Global Warfare Game Plan, and this actually got me started in into the engineering section. I brought in some artwork I did that was this, I used to copy comic book covers because I collected comic books too. It's uh, one of those things. And they wanted me to do artwork for a game. And so I said, sure, why not? <laughs> Instead of working in the factory, I'd much rather you know, have a nice desk job. And they, they put me into, uh, in charge of this global warfare project. And this was the, uh, the sketch that I did for them. They, they liked it, they approved it. And, it turned into that, finally. This was their sole venture into wide body games. Their, they made 10 of them. There was, there was just no market at the time that they decided to get into it. So the 10 of them, I think there's nine of them still floating around. I ran into one, it may have been in Atlanta. I'm not sure, but uh, it was, it's fun to run into one every once in a while. I didn't do the design, I just did the artwork. And that was just about enough for me in the artwork because um, it was okay. <laughs> Pinball Lizard was one of the first games that I actually got to stick my hands on to do a physical design. This was actually done by Ed Sabula with a very small assistance by me. I was more or less, he was my mentor that got me into this. He spent a lot of years at uh, uh, Data East too, after this. And he, prior to game plan, he worked at uh, Chicago Coin. So he'd been around. Oh, that, that, that was just some of the things I did. I did artwork for uh, the cabinets. <laughs> we did the stencil of the, of the tank in front. <laughs> well, Gottlieb uh, had an offer in I believe it was either Play Meter or Replay, I'm not sure which, looking for a pin game designer, believe it or not. And Game Plan had decided not to make pinballs anymore. They were getting into the doing the video games like you showed you there and uh, kidding them and into slot machines too. They were actually manufacturing for uh, another manufacturer that we were assembling them there. So they were busy. They didn't want to do... Uh, pinball anymore. So I took this offer up. I went to Gottlieb and uh, showed him my uh, 
designs, and he says, you know, I would love to hire, this is Gil Pollock, he's the guy that hired me over at uh, Gottlieb. I'd love to hire, he says, I just hired a guy, you know, yesterday for this position. He says, but I like your designs, he says, I'm gonna hire two guys today. <laughs> so I got lucky, very much so, and got in there. Anybody recognize that one? Rocky, Rocky right. Who's the other guy? Uh, Tom Safransky. Tom did Devil's Dare and a couple of other ones. And, uh, Volcano, too, he did. Yeah. And then he got out of it. He rather run a route than design pinball machines. Yeah, he, he, well, he was sleeping at the desk too often because he's burning the candle at both ends. But that's what he, he his choice was to go run a route. Uh, can you see any differences between this one and the, the production machine? You're, you're, you're good. <laughs> this jet bumper's gone in the, in the game. It cleaned up the shot. Yeah, it, it, it's just something you do you know, in a whitewood. You, you just put in ideas, and then you find out by playing them. That's why the whitewood's made, which is good and which is bad. That one was bad. But we had completed most of the artwork by that time, and we said, let's get rid of that bumper. So we just put a nice little piece art piece of, with Rocky on it in there. This is the glass that they used in the motion picture, uh, the Rocky Three, where Pauly gets angry at Rocky and he, and he wanders into a game arcade and he's got a whiskey bottle and he's drunk and he throws the thing at the back glass. Now you know the back glass is not gonna break. This one was made out of regular glass. And it was also before the game was actually selected that they had to do this up front to get it done in time for the movie. So they, they, they did something that almost came out like the, the, the final one, but we didn't have a, a game there either, so this was put on a force two. But you can, you can never see the play field real well in the movie. But we had a, it was an operational game. Anybody on this one? It's a hint, we're going chronologically. <laughs> You've seen it? Anybody? Spirit, you got it. <laughs> and basically the difference in this one was the uh, inclusion of the display in the play field as a bonus display. Stryker, I didn't have a picture of the, the Whitewood, I'm, I'm not sure. I originally wanted this to be a sci-fi game, but Soccer being very popular and seen as most of our games were heading into Europe anyhow at the time, they wanted a soccer game. So I said, I don't know soccer, and I really didn't. So we, we had a fellow, a couple of fellows in there that uh, did know soccer, so kind of just handed over the, the reins as far as getting a game and developed into it. And they did this. And we didn't make a lot of games, but I thought the game was fun. I don't know if there's one here. I, I don't think I've seen one. But it's it's kind of it's it's fun to play. Here's a, this is an unusual one. This is named after a video game, Cubert's <laughs> Quest, right? <laughs> that was another one of those things, those assignments. Let's do a pinball named after our very successful video game. And okay, <laughs> I get to do it. <laughs> this is. This is a, 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 if you get to play it, I don't know if there's one here either, if you get to play it, this is really unusual. This flipper down here was one of three drains after you went through the, the standard flippers up here. So if you went to this side, this flipper flipped with the right flipper in that manner. And the, the, the other one flipped with the left flipper. And this sent you around a figure eight back into play. Is the production photo? It did okay. Yeah, and I think a lot of it had to do with the uh, tie to Cubert. Yeah, it's kind of an unusual looking game too. Nice cabinet, huh? <laughs> but it's Cubert. Back 
then we weren't talking about you know, 8,000, 9,000 runs. We were talking 1,000, 1,200, 800 runs. It wasn't very good. Pinball was slowing down. This is the first crush from the video blood. And pinball slowed down quite a bit. This is my last wide body for Gottlieb. All those prior to that were all wide bodies, by the way, in case nobody noticed. Anybody know this one? Krull. Yeah, <laughs> Krull. This is a, we did a Fresnel lens with a, a, another level underneath that you could see in its entirety in this little window if you were sitting there playing it. Hmm. Nice artwork, nice, nice uh, package. It's, a, it's an okay game, I'll be honest with you. These are the only photos that we had of it, because there we made 10 of them, because they decided not to go into production on this. It was a fairly expensive game. And at this point in time, uh, Gottlieb had already been purchased by Columbia Pictures. Well, Columbia Pictures, was now purchased by Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola says, well, we want to play with this game company we have now, now that we own it. So everything got downsized after this. This was the last, this one, and uh, Going Nuts were the last two that they made 10 of, the wide bodies. That's the actual painting. And then, they reformed it as Milestar, which... Mm -hmm. You know, I don't recall, but there was the question is, uh, when Coca-Cola bought the company, was there any discussion of having a Coca-Cola game? Uh, not, not that I can recall. Milestar was uh, affectionately or unaffectionately uh, taken into uh, the engineering department. And during the announcement, one of our former lake designers, Ed Krinsky, who did tons of games for Gottlieb, let them know that Milestar, spelled backwards, is rat slime. Is it, they didn't appreciate it very much, but he could get away with it. <laughs> he, had, he had the legs. He could do it. And you know, so we became Milestar. While I'm doing that, as is an aside, the one game I did lay out for game, for game plan before I left, they had put away in the morgue, which they called the, just this little place where games went to sleep forever. They decided to get back into pinball. And they pulled this out and they made this just about the, the same time as that announcement going into Milestar was made. And Attila the Hun came out. And it's just a straight, basic game. Uh, it was my first effort. I was very shocked to see this thing at a show. <laughs> nice surprise, though. Crazy artwork. <laughs> okay, now, this is the austerity era, austerity era at, at the beginning of it at, at Milestar. Anybody got an idea on this one? Nope. Not Alien Star. How about the games? This was during the uh, Olympics in Los Angeles. And we did this. Alien Star, okay. <laughs> well, I tried to do an infinity mirror in the, in the middle of it at first. It, just, it didn't work. It, it wasn't bright enough. So we got rid of it and just did a that it, there's the experiment. You can see it if it was dark in the room. <laughs> but we just got rid of it and did a spiral pattern of, of lights. The photograph for the brochure. They decided to shut everything down, Coca-Cola. They, uh, they had their run with, uh, on the video end, they were making Mach 3 at the time, the Laserdisc game. And we all know how laser discs went. In the beginning, they were hot. You couldn't get it fast enough. And then they all started to fail because even the industrial laser disc players couldn't keep up with uh, 
the player. They, they wore out, they, they overheated, they, they ran into trouble. And even sending them new laser displayers didn't solve the problem, so did everybody want it out. The market went to hell, and Coca-Cola says, well, you know, we had a nice run on the first year, but the second year was not so good, so they just closed the company. We were able, I say that with tongue-in-cheek because I wasn't involved with the monetary end of it, but there was a couple of principals that got together to reform the pinball assets into premier technology. Uh, Gil Pollack turned into the uh, the president of Premier, and uh, Seren Fezjan, who was the uh, president of Mondial Distribution, took the uh, physical responsibility of getting the, the games, of uh, getting the company running. It was a nice, a nice marriage. This is John Buris. This is us after we just moved. You know how it is when you move. Boxes everywhere. Adolph Seitz Jr. having his cowboy boots on, on his desk. Look at the technology we had back then. This is great stuff. <laughs> oh, is that me? No, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, this is the first, we had done the samples of this game at, uh, at uh, Milestar, but we had this all ready to go. And as anybody could tell, this is this is an easy game. This is touchdown. That's John Beers again. So we finished up the production when we started premiere of El Dorado on the left, and we started the production of Touchdown on the right. Because there was some suspicion that we weren't going to survive. But I think we had the right people that got involved with, with the company to do this. Everybody was as dedicated as the, the people are now and the ones that took Stern through their hard times too. Okay, here's a good one. Anybody? Ice, ice fever, right? <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> Oh, there it is, up on the top. No, no fair looking at that. <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to just kind of move the screen off, uh, down a little bit. Come on, come on, mouse, mousey, mousey. So that's not fair looking at that anymore. Hmm. I didn't notice that. I was going to play. There's only one baseball game that was ever made with the Major League Baseball. And that was the Chicago Cubs, right. Being a lifelong Cub fan, it's just one of the few pieces of penance that I've had to pay. <laughs> maybe, th maybe this year. Actually, according to uh, Back to the Future movie, this is the year, 2015. <laughs> yeah, it's in the movie. <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> We, we did sell the back glasses frame too. So we sold a bunch of those. And this is the production line for the Cubs. There's that strange guy again. Putting the pounds on and getting the gray hair. <laughs> okay, this one, I hear there's one here. Anybody? Yeah, no, no, don't look at this. <laughs> yeah, tag team pinball. My first wrestling game. This is my second one now. I'm stirred. 28 years later, I think it was. A long time. Oh, man. These guys are sweet, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we had to put this little inset in here where the, the, the machine is there. I like to tell this story. Uh, to cover the anatomy of the fellow on the left because his shorts were very revealing. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to just not be offensive to anybody, he says, let's just put something right there. And that's why this came out. These guys are pretty, pretty brutal looking. <laughs> Okay, let's see who can read that word up there. <laughs> Rock. Yeah. We're, we 
we were, this was, Rock was actually the first game to use a translate. Hmm. Everything up until then had been back glasses. Uh, it wasn't photographic, it was a, a painting, and it was a printed translate. Some of the people, people from the factory. <laughs> and we did uh, an update, the music update. And this guy is Ken Hale, who is still in the racket. <laughs> he does work with Stern now, too. Not for Stern, but he does contract work for Stern. I don't know who the young lady is. She's got nice hair, too. <laughs> Raven. This is my tribute to uh, Firepower. I really liked Firepower. I tell Steve that's my favorite game I am. <laughs> and here's the sweetheart at the show. We couldn't find a girl model, female model, to play the, the Raven role on a, on a photographic back glass that had anything less than toothpick arms. This girl was a, an aerobics instructor. So she was in pretty good shape, physically. And she was the girlfriend of one of the people involved, and so she became Raven. <laughs> Our little helicopter in the background is a crop duster. <laughs> the, the little rods that hang out that usually dust the crop, they were photoshopped out. <laughs> we were starting to learn about new technology. <laughs> I hated that blowtorch coming out of the end of that weapon. I said, I've never seen muzzle fire like that in my life. <laughs> right. But it didn't matter. It was too late. Everything was printed. Cigarette Yeah, it could be <laughs> for about 20 cigarettes in a row. <laughs> right, right. That's Gil Pollock there, mugging. <laughs> Yeah, somebody's done a Goonies game out there. It's kind of fun to see it in that venue. I like it. I like it. See the difference in this one now. This bumper's gone, and there's a captive ball here now. And a slingshot. This whole area here got reformed from this first version. You could actually get into here from the top, and the ball would just fall through or, or, or bounce through. Like, This guy looked so much like Don Johnson, I thought it was him at first. But uh, this was actually taken on Ocean Boulevard in Miami. We got, do you rent a, uh, a Ferrari of a similar kind? I believe they had a black one in, in the uh, show. We found a red one. And they towed it there, pushed it off the trailer to the photo shoot. And when they were done shooting, pushed it back on the trailer. <laughs> it never got started. <laughs> But it was just nice to find one. Nice, nice fake clouds in the background. Uh, anybody see the mistake in this photograph? I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't, don't be telling anybody. <laughs> the Carlisle Hotel has these three beautiful fluorescents. This one was out at the photo shoot, and they forgot to fake in the reflection on the car. Right, should be right there. <laughs> Yeah, so, well, you, you learn about that years later. You go, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is Jeff Walker. He was our sales guy. He loved this stuff. And this one is Genesis. This is the first version without the uh, reveal of, of the Maria robot. I call it Maria Robot because this is really a tribute to Metropolis. I love that old movie. 1926 that was made. It's amazing. And one of my sons was about, I want to say six or seven, could not stand this. The, the, the midget fella that was playing in this. We had a poster that I said, you want this in your room? No! He was totally afraid of this guy. And his little sister, she was about three, she thought that was me. Because my hair is like this in the morning. Oh, that's Johnny. <laughs> it's crazy. This is uh, gold.
moldings. To get the lights on the, on the top piece, we had a switch in the back, and so when the guy says, okay, press the switch, that's why the, the model has his hand around back, and the lights would flash, and they took the picture. I'm sorry? There's the gold wings? Yeah. This one had a, uh, this bottom picture here is a, a vertical loop. It goes like this and out. That was hard to make and get it, and get it into production because he had to bend metal. Monte Carlo, we have uh, a selection of people. Here's Gil Pollock again. This is Jim Roberts, he was from uh, James Industries, I believe. And this is Elvin Gottlieb, the grandson of the founder of Gottlieb. He just recently passed away, I think it was last year. But Gottlieb, was, uh, Gottlieb I mean, Monte Carlo was a very good game for us. We sold a lot of these. Had a lot in it too. Had four four drop target banks, two threes and two twos, and and a roulette wheel. So it was a busy game. Along with pinball machines, the Premier decided they wanted to try something else. So they were trying to advertise the, our capabilities of building PC boards. And this is actually taken in, in the plant. We did all our stuff there. We had a wave solder machine. This was the uh, manufacturing for the pinball in uh, Bensonville, Illinois. And this was a building that I never understood why. We did our cables up in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't know why. But there was a truck that used to come twice a week loaded with bear, loaded with cables. And Don was the was the uh, driver's name Fargo Don's here and we had to go and load the cables. I don't know why that happened. Maybe they inherited it. You know, the, the, the mystery's over and everybody reads Spring Break. <laughs> this is a fun game too. This is the first one we did with an electronic, sh with an electric shooter. We didn't have a plunger in the game. But that way we could feed the balls to the shooter. This game has been uh, getting some notif notice lately. TX Sector, and uh, I, I, I like this game too. I thought this was one of those goofy things that you know we try, and, and you're, you're not always going to be successful. But uh, as long as everything blends together, and it seemed to on that game, this is the, the brochure that they made for it. They did not make a conventional. Eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, and this was tipped into the productions, uh, the the publications, the magazines, just like this. So you pulled it out and you unfolded it. Hey John, back yeah. To spring break. Mm -hmm. Who thought? Who thought of the Spuds McKenzie bumpers and the dog barking? That was probably Jeff Walker. He did. He ran a lot of the. Uh, uh, the first assaults on, on licensing or pseudo licensing at the time because it's much easier just to imitate than it is to go and spend the money on the license. Yeah, the Spuds McKenzie. TX, 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 TX. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. This is Victory, Whitewood. As you can see, there used to be a window with a lower level. And it was inverted lower level a la Black Hole and Haunted House. It wasn't as big as their lower levels, but it was, it was substantial. It was there. But there was so much on this game because it was a lower level and an upper level that uh, the decision was made to, to pull the... Uh, lower level out of the game and just use lights. There was also a, a thought that possibly we could get a little racetrack going down there with on, on a, a car on a belt and you just move the car around. There again, cost. <laughs> that got pulled. Then I had an idea, let's do a single level game. And so we did Silver Slugger, my other baseball game. And this was very well received by, by the, uh, the people on the street. 
and we decided to make the street level location, uh, street level type of game, street location type of game, which was a, basically a single level. Along at this time came another company, and I can't recall his name now, but they wanted us to make cocktail pinballs for them. Thank you very much. International concepts, and it's uh, it was an, it was an endeavor by me. I was the only one that had any experience with cocktail machines working a game plan. So they says, "What do you want to do first? And I says, "Well, let's get a game plan cocktail machine in here and copy it." And basically, that's what happened for the cabinet. Then we had to worry about stuffing the system all inside that cabinet. And you can get, it could get done, it was tight, but we got it done, and the same problems for, uh, uh, for that game plan had building these, so did Premier. But they got it done. First game come, was Night Moves. We put the display in the play field rather than on the bottom arch like game plan originally had it, because we had progressed to the alphanumeric. And they did pretty well with it, I guess, because they wanted to get a, a second machine. So I did Caribbean Cruise. And this one was multi-ball and four flippers in it, too. This one, I would like to pick one of these up one of these days and take it home. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, that game, for, for a cocktail pinball. We also did a little venture into bringing old games back to life. This one was uh, a takeoff of Sinbad, which had sold like 15,000 units back in the day. And there was one more. This uh, turned into uh, that's the Sinbad. Excalibur turn was taken from Countdown, which there is one here. I noticed there. <laughs> That's Countdown. And the last game I left with them when we had our, our little disagreement, I decided to leave Premier because they didn't want to do the more luxurious games with the ramps and everything anymore. They were just wanted to be stuck in the single level games. I left the Whitewood with them and they finished it up. So I wasn't real happy with the way it came out, but I have to take credit. <laughs> it's like you get saddled. I walked into Williams the following week and started two projects simultaneously. One was Bugs Bunny and the other one the Bride of Pinbot. And they were both done with Python Angelo. He did the artwork on almost all of this. He had already started this play field and I was more or less given the task, come on, I'll see, given the task to uh, finish it up. And I thought it came out pretty good. This is actually the, the game that sold the most for me. They sold over 8,000 units on this one. Good old Python. <laughs> His motto definitely was sex sells. <laughs> uh, I did the game with, uh, um, called Black Rose, it was, uh, uh, of course, a pirate theme game, but with the with the lady captain. I don't know if I have a. Ah, uh, oh yes, this fella right here. <laughs> All I need is a knife. Yeah, we took some stills of the guys: Mark Ritchie, Greg Freres, and this guy right here is Pat McMahon. He was the artist. That was a lot of fun. We put our pictures, our faces in there. <laughs> and another creature. 
never anticipated the difficulty that those holograms would, would, would have years down the line. Some of them turned green, some of them were perfect. So it was just in a manufacturing process, I guess. I still have the model, the original model if anybody wants to get a place to make a hologram. <laughs> I enjoyed making that game. We had a lot of fun with that. Little jump ball. Now the one on the right, the model on the right is done in shades of gray. That's the way they shoot holograms. It's all monochromatic. It's all done in shades of gray. Go ahead. What do you think of the video mod that they've recently come out with to replace the hologram? Oh, that takes the place in, inside? I, I love it. I think it's really cool. I mean, you got to put something in there. <laughs> it's better than saying, you know, out of order. <laughs> yeah, no, I do love it. I've seen it. I've only seen it once, but I do like it. It's cool. And the other one was the, uh, the backup model that now that we had the, the hologram made, I says, I'm going to paint it. So I painted it. John? And that's the one I still have. Sure. Um, I think Creature is probably one of the best integrations of theme in pinball ever. Um, can you talk a little bit about the development process for Creature and yeah. how you came up with the game? Uh, the idea for me started out as a 3D project. I wanted to do something in 3D and, and incorporate it in a pinball machine. We originally had the play field decked out with anaglyph artwork and you put the glasses on and everything on, on the plastics and the play field was in 3D. But it was black and white 3D with the anaglyph glasses, you know, the red green ones. And it was really unusual looking. The effect was there, but I didn't think they would buy that uh, in production. So the second thought was to do a hologram. And we, we researched it and found out that uh, Polaroid was the major manufacturer in the United States at the time of holograms and talked with them and they were willing to do it. So we had a sculptor, Jerry Pinsler, uh, brought in and he, he did a lot of work for, for Williams at the time. And he did the, the original sculpt of this. It started out as a kit bash from a Japanese model. I believe that it was one of these type of uh, poses and he changed it and made it look like he's reaching up. Actually, it looks like he's catching a fly ball in baseball. But so the, the one on the right was, was for, the, for the hologram, the one on the left I was painting on. Uh, bringing back to the question, uh, the, the comment, the drive-in fell into it also very easily. In fact, the game became more of a drive-in game than, than a creature from the Black Lagoon game, which probably made the game because I think it's just so much fun to go around the driving and do the things that you do. Uh, sneaking in, uh, people in the trunk, uh, the, uh, peeping Tom, you know, punching his lights out, and going to the snack bar, you know, there's onion rings in here, <laughs> and, and other things. It turned out to be a lot, of, a lot of fun. And I like the fact that that much humor went into the game. I'm still trying to get a sequel done. So I'm working on it. <laughs> you just keep the, put, put, pressing the button, pressing the button. We got to do this. We got to do this. And that was the first stand-up I made for, in the, for the pinball machines. I also made a patch. I thought we were going to get some uh, team jackets, but we never did. We got team sweatshirts. And these went on the back of them. And Judge Dredd was the same uh, development team. Myself, uh, uh, Jeff Johnson, basically, did this. It was almost coincidental with the Stallone movie. They, I was offered the Stallone movie. But hmm. I brought the theme up before they offered it to me. Because at that point, all it was was just it was pretty much just a cult comic, and it was the subject of an anthrax song. 
So. Well, I don't remember the Anthrax song. <laughs> I do remember the comic book, because I think I had every issue being a comic book collector. <laughs> that and, uh, what was it, AD 2000, I think, was the, was the other book that uh, he was in. And I loved Judge Dredd. I loved his attitude. And he, given the choice between the Stallone and, and the original, I said, I'm going with the original. And we did. And the people were somewhat difficult to work with, but they got they came around. Uh, we had fun with it. The version, the problem with the with the Dead World is there was a perceived when we sent the uh, the samples out, and Europe got theirs. There was a perce a perception that there were possibly. Uh, be a ball hang up in, in the dead world if the crane didn't work. Well, th that to me was not an argument because if, if you got a, a kick out hole, the ball's going to be sitting in there if, if the kick out hole fails, or even the, the ball eject in the out hole. If it doesn't kick the ball into the shooter lane, you're dead. So they listened to him because this guy was really adamant about it, and we, we uh, modded it to uh, allow the ball to fall out of there if the crane didn't pick it up, if, it, if the ball continued around. Uh, so the locks were virtual, pretty much. The kit, I guess, came out a, few, a number of years later that put the, the original round circles back in there and hold, hold the ball. This picture with the eagle so shiny might have been taken with one of the few samples we got from Northern Plastics that uh, he brought in as a, uh, uh, a speculation on actually vacuum metalizing the eagle. It looked fantastic, but it was very expensive. So the 10, that was all we got. <laughs> the Flintstones. This was a fun thing for me too. I didn't get this because of the comp, because of the cartoon. I got this because of the movie. And we were having some fun. Where are we? I know we're in there somewhere. This is the original for the for the bottom arch. And the two rotational molds for the uh, the side buildings. There we are. And we actually got to visit Bedrock. They had just finished shooting within the last week or two after this. And the following week, if we had been there a week later, this wouldn't have been there. The fellow that is actually done in a quarry, as you can see in the background, they built this whole town in a quarry. And this fellow that owned the quarry owned two quarries. And one was on this side of the road, and then the other one was on that side of the road. And his policy was to work alternate quarries every year. And this year he didn't work this one, so they gave them permission to build the bedrock in there. That was fun. All really life size. That's Kevin O'Connor, he's the artist on it. And Jeff Johnson is the other guy in the striped shirt. <laughs> Mugging for the camera. Flintstones originally was a wide body. And at, at that original point of development, it was like, well, we could go back to the narrow. And I prefer the narrow as far as gameplay is concerned. It, it just plays better at 20 and a quarter inches wide. So I just abandoned this one, and we lost a few things, but that's okay. I think the, I think the, uh, the narrow game plays better. And my last effort at Williams was Congo. And this window is still hanging around. It's in the big Lebowski, I think. It's the same window. <laughs> Kevin O'Connor again on the artwork. Bill Grupp on the software. And the project I was working on was called Aces Escape from the Bermuda Triangle. When 
the first X fell. And it was uh, myself and uh, Barry Ausler and Dennis Norman were let go the same day. This never got finished. Barry's game was 90% done. It was Junkyard, and they finished that one up. This was supposed to be after it. And that's the uh, AutoCAD play field. This was uh, my Beatles game that I had worked up and did a presentation on it. This was the upper level. This is the reflective idea that I had. And uh, they didn't want to see pinball at that time. This, this is a Neil DeCastro decision. Uh, any, any bigger than it was. Uh, not more, better, but just spending more money on it. And this one had a, th a second play field in, in the head, and it came out as a marquee. And where you were looking at it, when the lights went out on the upper, on the bottom level, and the lights went on on the, on the top one, it appeared down where the uh, apparent play field is. And the idea worked. They just didn't want to go with that. And beyond, so when I got out of pinball, I didn't get out of pinball. There was a company in, in Buffalo, New York called ICE. They make uh, redemption games and alley rollers. And they says, we're going to make pinball machines. This is great. <laughs> so I says, let me see your facility. They brought me out there as, as, as come on, I'll show you what we got. And this was uh, the first project they wanted me to work on. It was, it was supposed to be a, a Caddyshack, which I think was a great uh, theme. And this is after I had learned to use SolidWorks. So it was nice to see everything in 3D. Of course, they decided not to get to finish it, their ideas. I stayed there for a while, did an alley roller game called Duncan Alien. You may, might have seen that around in, in Chuck E. Cheese. But it, it's not my cup of tea. So I left them, went and took regular jobs. <laughs> In the meanwhile, uh, my buddy Jim Shelberg hooked me up with uh, the people at Fox Sports, and they asked me to design a game for their 2005, I believe, All-Star game, Major League All-Star game, because they wanted a real play field designed by a, a pinball designer, and not just a, somebody who would artist something together. So I, got, I came up with this for, for their uh, concept. Let me see if I can. I just wanted to show you the, the commercial they came up with. It was really sensational. Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Probably have seen this, there it is. but maybe not. Sound working? Okay, give it a minute. I love the speed. Not cooperating today. There it goes.
I think we did a great job. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> quit, 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 quit. I was just informed that they uh, probably spent about about a million dollars on this production. Nice. Okay, where are we back? Yeah, that's it. Okay, and let's hurry up through. I've got a, a project still running in, in the UK. Uh, we decided to make a, another game themed after uh, Forbidden Planet, one of my favorite, all-time favorite sci-fi movies. If you can stand it, it's 1956, and it's a really, really good movie for 1956. And it was game over there for a while until I got the call from George Gomez. And I managed to get a couple of early photos of the Whitewood of Mustang. That's my first game back. So Stephen Martin, one of the fellows that works in the art department says, stand by your game, this is the first one. Okay, thanks. And this is WrestleMania. It's the computer. <laughs> Believe me. There we go. This is the shot just to designed to show you, to illustrate how we were able to get the two levels on the game, but we're only using one piece of wood. So the upper level is actually cut out of, of the main play field. It's left with little small webs in it in case the play field gets rejected for some reason, it can go back just like that to the, to the silk screening company and they can redo it. So we don't lose anything. It was easy enough, we've made a little uh, station to cut them out and it works really great. And these are, these are around today. And for really, that's it for now. <laughs> uh, anybody got some questions or something? Wait, I want to. I want to get a mic over to you. Yes, Mr. Trudeau. When are you going to get to pick your uh, your theme? I'm sorry. When will you be able to select your own theme? Well, it's it's pretty much a uh, a meeting of the minds. Uh, I can make suggestions. Do you mean an original theme? Or, or even a license. The license that you want to make. Well, I, actually, the, the next one will be one. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Don't be clapping before it comes out. <laughs> That's the kiss of death. <laughs> Anyone else? This gentleman here. Every, every designer loves working for the top company and making the top game. How does it felt for you going from starting with Game Plan as a very entry company and rising all the way up through, you know, Williams number one and then Stern, the only, you know, left? It, it was an experience, I'll say that much, but what it did do is give me uh, an insight into the, the proper way to really make a good game and to spend the right amount of money on the assets needed to make a game that would just kick butt, literally, uh, was done at Williams. And we, we kept people working in the factory at, at Premier, and Gottlieb had its own, own ways because they were the king in the, in the 70s. And I, I really enjoyed myself at Williams the most. Okay, that's it, great. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming. Oh, what, one more? We got one more last one right here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I want to uh, know at what age did you get interested in pinball and uh, where did you go to school to learn all the tricks <laughs> of the trade? <laughs> that's crazy, because I used to be an offset pressman. I ran a printing press for seven, eight years, and I decided I'm just not having any fun. 
So I answered an ad in the Chicago Tribune for a game tester from Game Plan. And I had some electronics training in the Air Force when I was there. And he says, okay, you can be a game tester. And that's where it started. I never, never anticipated going as far as it has right now. Okay? <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone.